the five khandas. As long as these human bodies are alive and their senses are operating, we have to be constantly on our guard, alert and mindful, because the force of habit of grasping the sensual world as a self is so strong. This is very strong conditioning in all of us. So the way the Buddha taught is the way of mindfulness and wise reflection. Rather than making metaphysical statements about true nature or ultimate reality, the Buddha's teaching points to the condition of grasping. That's the only thing that keeps us from enlightenment. Buddha wisdom is an understanding of the way things are through observing oneself, rather than observing how the stars and planets operate. We don't go out looking at the trees and contemplating nature as if they were an object of our vision, but we actually observe nature as it operates through our personal form. What we take ourselves to be can be classified as five aggregates or khandhas. Rupa, form. Vedana, feeling. Sanya, perception. Sankara, mental formations or thought processes. Vinyana, sense consciousness. They provide a skillful means of seeing all sensual phenomena in groups. The easiest to meditate on is the rupa khanda, the form of your own body, because it's stuck to the ground, heavy, gross. It's a slower moving thing than the mental phenomena, vedana, sanya, sankara, or vinyana. You can reflect on your own body for long periods of time, meditate on the breath rather than on consciousness, because it is within our ability to concentrate on breathing. Ordinary people can contemplate their own breath. You can contemplate the feeling of your own eyes. They have sensations. Contemplate the tongue, the wetness of the mouth or your tongue touching the palate in your mouth. You can contemplate the body as a sense organ, giving you the sensations of pleasure and pain, heat and cold. Just observe what the feeling of cold or heat in the body is like. You can contemplate that because it's not what you are. It's an object you can see, can easily observe, as if it were something separate from yourself. If you don't do that, you just tend to react. When you're too hot, you try to get cooler and take off your jumper, and then you grow cold and put it back on again. You can just react to those sensations of pleasure and pain in the body. Pleasure. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And you try to hold on to it, to have more pleasure and pain. Oh, get rid of that and you run away from anything uncomfortable or painful. But in meditation, we can see these sensations in the body itself is a sensual condition that has pleasure and pain, heat and cold. You can reflect on the forms that you see. Just look at something beautiful, like flowers. Flowers are probably the most beautiful things on the earth, and so we like flowers. So note when you look at a flower, how you're drawn to it and want to keep looking at it being attracted to what's pleasing to the eye. Or look at something that's unpleasant to the eye, say, excrement. When you see excrement, cow dung on the path, you politely ignore it. Look at your own excrement. We produce it ourselves, and yet it's something that we don't really want to go around showing other people. It's something we'd rather nobody ever saw us producing. You don't really feel drawn to go looking at it like you would a flower, do you? But we're quite willing to wear flowers, carry flowers around, have flowers on our shrine. It's not that you should find excrement attractive. I'm just pointing out that you can meditate on this force of the sensory world. It's a natural force. It's not bad or wrong, but you can meditate on it and see how you tend to react to sensory experiences. When you experience beautiful sounds or horrible ones, pleasant odors or stinking ones, pleasant tastes or unpleasant ones, pleasurable physical sensations or painful ones, heat and cold. Meditate on these things. Look and see these things as they are. All rupa is impermanent. Beautiful flowers are only beautiful for a while, and then they become repulsive. So we observe this natural transformation from what is fresh and beautiful to what is old and ugly. I was a lot prettier when I was 20. Now I'm old and ugly. An old human body is not very beautiful, but it's the body following what it's supposed to do. 
I'm glad mine is not getting prettier. I'd be embarrassed if it was. The mental condas also operate on that same principle. Waiting is a mental state. The feeling you have of attraction and aversion to the physical things that you see, hear, smell, taste, touch. The sensation of pain is just as it is. But then there's the reaction of liking or disliking. Or not even there, but just a moving towards or away from it. You can be aware of feelings, moods. Note the heat that comes from anger. The dullness that comes from doubt and sloth and torpor. Note the feeling when you're jealous. You can witness that feeling. Watch instead of just trying to annihilate jealousy. When jealousy conditions your mind, begin to reflect on it rather than reacting to it or trying to get rid of it because you don't like it. When you're cold, what is coldness? Do you like it? This coldness, feeling cold, is that something terribly unpleasant or you do you just make a lot out of it? Hunger. What's hunger like? When you're feeling hungry, meditate on that physical feeling to which you tend to react by trying to get something to eat. Or meditate on the feeling of being alone or separate, that feeling that people look down on you. If you feel I don't like you, meditate on that feeling. Or if you feel you don't like me, meditate on that. Bring this into consciousness now, but not analytically, trying to figure out whether I really do like you or whether your relationship to me is a dependent, childlike relationship that you shouldn't have or getting caught up in Freudian psychology or whatever. Just observe the doubting, uncertain state of mind in your relationship to others. Not to analyze, but just to observe the feelings of confidence or lack of confidence, aversion or attraction. That's Vedana. This is a natural thing. We're all sensitive beings, so attraction or repulsion are operating all the time. They're conditions in nature, not a personal problem unless we make it so. Sanya Kanda is the perception Kanda. To grasp a perception means to believe in the way things appear in the present, as if they have a kind of permanent quality. It's how we tend to operate in our lives. So I might think, for example, that a particular monk is this way. It's a perception I have, whether I'm sitting next to him or I'm alone, whether he's helping me or he's angry with me. I have this fixed view. A fixed perception is not all that conscious, but I tend to operate from that particular fixed position if I believe in my perception. And when I think of him in that way, it's as if his personality is fixed and constant rather than being the way it is at this time. My perception of him is just a perception of the moment. It's not a soul that carries through time, not a fixed personality. So Sanya is to be meditated on. Khandas are mental formations. They are perceptions of the mind, Sanya. And on the basis of them are our mental activities, Sankara. So the assumption that you have about yourself from childhood, parents, teachers, friends, relatives, and whether you perceive yourself as good and positive or in a negative or confused way, all that is the Sanya Sankara Khandas. Memories come up or fears about what you might be lacking. You can worry that there might be a serious flaw in your character or that some horrible repressed desires might be lurking way down deep in your mind which might come up in meditation and drive you crazy. That's another mental condition, not knowing what we are, so that sometimes we imagine the worst possible things. But what we can know is that whatever we believe ourselves to be is a condition of the mind. It arises, it passes away, and it's impermanent. If we come from certain fixed perceptions of ourselves, we conceive all kinds of things. If you operate from the position, I am a man, you assume that perception of yourself is what you are. So you never investigate that perception. You just believe that you're a man and then conceive manhood as being a certain way, what a man should be. Then you compare yourself to what the ideal for manhood is, and if you don't live up to those high standards of manhood, you worry. Something's wrong. You start feeling upset or guilty. You're hating yourself because of your basic assumption that you're a man. 
On a conventional level, this might be true. Men are this way and women are that way. We're not denying the conventional reality, but we're no longer attaching to it as a personal quality, a fixed position to take at all times and all places. This is a way of freeing ourselves from that quality of being bound to unsatisfactory conditions. If you believe in being a man or a woman as your true identity in your soul, that belief will always take you to a depressing state of mind. All these are perceptions we have. We create so much misery over perceiving ourselves to be black or white, or members of a certain nationality or class. In England, people suffer because of their perception of belonging to a certain class. In America, we suffer from not having any perceptions of class, from the perception that we're all the same, we're all equal. It's the attachment to any of these, even to the highest, most egalitarian perception that takes us to despair. By investigating these five heaps, aggregates or groups, you begin to see them. You can know them as objects because they're anatta, not self. If they were what you are, you wouldn't be able to see them. You'd only be able to be them. You'd have no way of witnessing them or detaching from them. You'd just be caught into them all the time, without any ability to detach and observe them. But being men, women, monks, nuns, Italian, Danish, Swiss... English, American, Canadian, or whatever, is only a relative truth, relative to certain situations. Yet we can operate our lives from fixed positions of being, I'm American, and we're this way. Throughout the world, we have those national prejudices and racial prejudices. These are just perceptions and conceptions, sanya, sankara, khandas, that we can observe. When you have a fixed view about somebody, one thing I can't stand is Hondurans. You can observe that in your mind. Even if you have strong prejudices and feelings, but you try to get rid of them, that comes from assuming that you shouldn't have any prejudices at all. That you shouldn't have any bad feelings towards anybody, and you should be able to accept criticism with an equanimous mind and not feel angry or upset. That's another very idealistic assumption. See that as a condition of mind and keep observing. Rather than hating ourselves or hating others for being prejudiced, we observe the very limitations of any prejudices or perceptions and conceptions of the mind. We meditate on the impermanent nature of perception. In other words, we don't try to justify, explain, get rid of, or change anything. We just try to observe that all things change, all that begins ends. And then we meditate on the vinyana kanda, consciousness, the sensory consciousness of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, and how one thing goes to another, aware of the movements of consciousness of the senses. Looking at something, hearing something, this changes very rapidly. All these five khandhas are anicca, impermanent. When we chant, Rupang anichang, Vedana anicca, Sanya anicca, Sankara anicca, Vinyanang anicca. This is very profound. Then we chant, Sabe Sankara anicca. Sankara here means all conditioned phenomena, all sensory experience. The sense organs, the objects of the sense organs, the consciousness that arises on contact. All this is sankara and is a Nietzsche. All is conditioned. So sankara here includes the four other khandhas, rupa, vedana, sanya, vinyana. With this, you have a perspective from which the conditioned world is infinitely variable and complex. But where do you separate sanya from sankara or sankara from vinyana? It's best not to try to make precise divisions between these five aggregates. They're just convenient means for looking at things, helping you to meditate on mental states, the physical world and the sensory world. 
We're not trying to fix anything as permanently Sankara or definitely Sanya. We're just using these labels to observe that the sensory world, from the physical to the mental, from coarse to refined, is conditioned, and all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. Then you have a way of seeing the totality of the conditioned world as impermanent, rather than getting involved in it at all. In this practice of insight meditation, we're not trying to analyze the conditioned world, but to detach from it, to see it in a perspective. This is when you really begin to comprehend the Nietzsche. You insightfully know that Sabe Sankara Anicca. So any thoughts and beliefs you have are just conditions. But I'm not saying that you shouldn't believe in anything. I'm just pointing out a way to see things in perspective so you're not deluded by them. We won't grasp the experience of emptiness or the unconditioned, the deathless, as a personal attainment. Some of you have been grasping that one as a kind of personal attainment, haven't you? I know emptiness. I've realized emptiness and patting yourselves on the back. That's not sabe dhamma anatta. That's grasping the unconditioned, making it into a condition, me and mine. When you start thinking of yourself as having realized emptiness, you can see that also as a condition of the mind, sabe dhamma anatta. All things are not self, not a person, not a permanent soul, not a self of any sort. That's very important to contemplate also, because sabe dhamma includes all things, both the conditioned phenomena of the sensory world and the unconditioned, the deathless. Notice that Buddhists make no claim for deathlessness as being a self either. I have an immortal soul, or God is my true nature. The Buddha avoided all statements of that nature. Any possible conceiving of oneself as anything at all is an obstacle to enlightenment because you attach to an idea again, to a concept of yourself as being part of something. Maybe you think there's a piece of you, a little soul that joins the bigger one at death. That's a conception of the mind that you can know. We're not saying it's untrue or false, but we're just being the knowing knowing what can be known. We don't feel compelled to grasp that as a belief. We see it as only something that comes out of the mind, a condition of the mind, so we let even that go. Keep that formula. All conditions are impermanent. All things are not self, for reflection. And then whatever happens in your life as you live it, you can see. Sabe sankara anicca. Sabe Dhamma Anatta. It keeps you from being deluded if miraculous phenomena happen to you. And it's a way of understanding other religious conventions. Christians come along and say, Only through Jesus Christ can you be saved. You can't be saved through Buddhism. Buddha was only a man, but Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So you think, Oh, I wonder, maybe they're right. After all, when you go to one of these born-again meetings, everybody's radiating happiness. Their eyes are bright, and they say, praise the Lord. When you go to a Buddhist monastery, and they just sit there for hours on end watching your breath, you don't get high like that. So you might start doubting and think, maybe that's right. Maybe Jesus is the way. But what you can know is that there's a doubt. Look at that doubt or the feeling of being intimidated by other religions when they come on strong, or feeling averse to them, or having prejudices against religions. What you can know is that these are perceptions of the mind. They come and go and change. Keep a constant cool reflection on these things, rather than trying to figure them out or feel that you have to justify being a Buddhist. Christians may say, you can't do anything for the third world. And you say, we, we, we chant. We share merit and we radiate loving kindness. 
That sounds pretty weak in a situation where you're talking about malnutrition and starvation in Africa. But now, at this time, there's this opportunity to understand the limits of what you can do. All of us would definitely do something about starvation in Africa if we could. If we felt that there was something one individual could do here and now at this time. Reflect on this. What's the real problem at this time? Is it the problem of starvation in Africa? Or is it human selfishness and ignorance? Isn't starvation in Africa the result of human greed, selfishness, and stupidity? Therefore, we open our minds to the Dhamma. We wisely reflect on it and then realize it. Truth is to be realized and known within the context of personal experience. But the practice is a continuous one. I still practice all the time. Things change. People praise and blame. The world goes on. One just keeps reflecting on it through sabe sankara anicca, sabe dhamma anatta. When you recognize the conditioned and the unconditioned, you have what's called the ability to develop the path. And there's no more confusion about that. The goal now is to realize Nibbana, or the deathless, or non-attachment, to realize what it's like not to be attached to the five khandhas. Realize that when you're sitting here and you're really at peace. There's no attachment to the five khandhas then, but you might make a perception out of that peacefulness and attach to that, and always try to meditate in order to become peaceful again, according to a perception. That's why the practice is continuously letting go, rather than an attainment. Sometimes when you become calm on retreat, you can have a very peaceful mind and you attach to it. So you meditate in order to attain that blissful state again. But insight meditation means looking into the nature of things, of the five khandhas, seeing them as anicca, impermanent, as dukkha, unsatisfactory. None of these khandhas have the ability to give you any kind of permanent satisfaction. Their very nature is unsatisfactory and anatta. Start to investigate and wisely consider sabe sankara anicca, sabe dhamma anatta, rather than thinking you've attained something or that you've got to hold on to that attainment and starting to resent somebody who gets in your way. Note what's an attachment. When your mind is really concentrated, let go of it. Rather than just indulging in that peaceful feeling attached to something, worry about something, do it deliberately so that you begin to see how you go out and grasp things or worry about losing them. In your practice, as you begin to understand and experience letting go, you begin to realize what Buddhas know. Sabe Sankara Anicca, Sabe Dhamma Anatta. It's not just a string of words. Even a parrot can say the words. But it's not an enlightened parrot. Insight is different from conceptual knowledge. But now you're penetrating, going deep into this, breaking through the illusion of self as being anything at all, or nothing. If you believe that you don't have a self, that's another belief. I believe I don't have a self. We believe in no self. You see that the Buddha pointed to the way between those two extremes of believing you have a self and believing that you don't have a self. You cannot find anything in the five khandhas which is permanent, which is a permanent self or soul. Things arise out of the unconditioned. They go back to the unconditioned. It's therefore through letting go not through adopting any other attitude, that we seek to no longer attach to mortal conditions. <laughs>